Thank you very much, and I really am honored to be here. It's one thing to, um, to work on policy and try to be constructive and helpful, but it's quite another thing to be at the rock face on the front lines, dealing with people who are going through challenging and difficult times. And we always underestimate the value, the importance, and the service provided by people who do that, like every single one of you here. And I'm honored to be amongst you this morning. You know, Art Eggleton is not here today because I left the Senate about a year and a half ago to go work at Massey College. He still is a practicing senator. And often in the last five days of the Senate hearings, more work is done than the previous five months. So he is there today working hard to vote against bad legislation and to vote for good legislation so that the product of the Senate activities this week is constructive and balanced. Art was a colleague and an honorable one who chaired the overall committee of which the Subcommittee on Urban Poverty, which I chaired, was a part. He was instrumental in the round tables and the hearings all across Canada that brought social workers and civil servants and frontline community workers, Canadians with the lived in poverty experience, to share and impart with economists and academics and municipal officials and provincial cabinet ministers on the causes and pathology of urban poverty and what a sane and coherent society might try to do about it. I've been a proponent of a basic income grant or a guaranteed annual income or in today's lingo, a refundable anti-poverty tax credit <laughs> since 1969. Art came to this conclusion over time. But as a mayor in Toronto who invested more in social housing than any Toronto mayor before him, and as we speak is advising Mayor John Tory on public housing challenges in Toronto on a pro bono basis, I have a deep respect for his pragmatic and coherent approach to the challenges of government and making a difference in real people's lives. I'm pleased to report that as the movement of new ideas through cautious democracies uh, can sometimes be problematic, we who propose doing away with welfare and creating a federal basic income top-up are able to report progress. And Tireless and inspired organizations like the National Basic Income Canada Network, whose current executive director is Sheila Regeer, who is a former executive director of the Canada Welfare Council, and Rob Rayner, who used to head the anti-poverty organization nationally, are making real progress. And in places like my hometown of Kingston, there are the local branches like the Big Push organization, with involvement of Kingstonians like Elaine Power and Tony Pickard, who are working very, very hard to address how a basic income grant would solve a lot of the difficulties that are now addressed in other less efficient and constructive ways in our system. Here's some good news. Very recently, the Muskoka Public Health Authority made a motion some days ago at a province-wide meeting of public health officers and authorities in support of a guaranteed annual income and it passed. That is now the policy position of all public health authorities in the sovereign province of Ontario. That, my friends, is an important beginning. The mayors of Calgary and Edmonton, individuals I have met with and who I know have stepped up to advocate and endorse a basic income floor, as has the newly elected premier and former president of UPEI in the province of PEI. The Green Party is on side and has been, to Elizabeth May's credit, for some time. It's part of their national platform. The Liberal Party of Canada endorsed two policy resolutions at its most recent national convention in support of more pilot projects, like the very successful MinCom experiment that took place in Dauphin, Manitoba in the mid-70s. Look it up. MinCom. Dauphin, Manitoba and look at all what's been done recently to assess the implications of how that program operated. There is a young and very courageous political scientist by the name of Dr. Evelyn Forget, 
who's been doing all the analytical and an analytical work about what happened in Dauphin. How did the program operate? What did it cost? What did we learn? Typically Canadian, Mr. Trudeau was the Prime Minister, Mr. Schreier was the Premier back in the 70s. They agreed on this experiment. It ran for five years. Then both governments were defeated and the subsequent governments didn't continue the program and didn't even analyze whether what had done had been of any value. But that analysis is going on now and the literature as it emerges is very constructive. Why? And this will actually impact each and every one of you in the perspective that you bring to your most important tasks. Not only did 17% of the population in Dauphin get topped up automatically at the end of the year if they didn't earn up to a minimum from the normal activities in what was an agricultural community, but there were benefits for the entire community from that modest top-up. Benefit one. Hospitalization went down during that five-year period by 8%. Arrests went down by 20%. Truancy at school went down by 50%. Why? Because the anxiety of not knowing whether you had enough money to pay the rent, to have food, to pay for the heat, to have transportation, to have some clothing was erased by the MINCOM program. And all those people on the far right wing who said, you know, if you pay people to do nothing, they will do nothing. MINCOM wasn't a good event for them, because guess what? Labor participation did not reduce at all during that program, because guess what? Folks don't want to be topped up to what is a very modest level. They'd like to earn more. And the way the program was structured, you didn't have a massive disincentive, as you do with our present welfare programs across Canada, if you try to earn a little more. And there were two groups, however, who didn't quite get into the workforce as intently as they had before the MINCOM experiment. High school students stayed in school. Do you know how important it is for the future of that kid and that family and that town that high school students could stay in school and finish their program. And some mothers, caught then in the sandwich generation, older parents who they had to help with, younger kids who weren't quite ready for school, they used the opportunity to stay home a little longer and do those kinds of things which are of such compelling social and spiritual value to the way we live our, live our lives together as families and in communities. So I believe we are on the cusp of a very substantial breakthrough. You can see it in provincial provinces and policies, rather. I think that um, Debbie Matthews, the deputy premier of this province, she, by the way, was a witness. Art Eggleton, he was a liberal. I'm not. Got her to come. She was a liberal. I'm not. And to give testimony before our committee. And here's what she said. And she was then the minister responsible for poverty reduction in Ontario. And here's what she said. The manual administration for income support workers, Ontario Works, as it was called then, has 900 pages. You can be the finest public servant in the history of humankind. A manual administration, 900 pages, against which you have to assess the requirements of your caseload completely inhuman, unworkable, and a massive waste of everybody's time. And when people say, well, do you have any example of where this might have worked before? I said, yeah, I got an example. It's called Ontario, 1975. Minority government. Mr. Davis was the premier. I was a 25-year-old legislative assistant. So as you know, when you're 25, you know everything. You don't need any help or advice from anybody. And the NDP and the Liberals, to their credit, were very concerned about the level of poverty amongst senior citizens, which back in the 70s were largely women. Men were dying a lot sooner than they do now. And many of those women had been left without any savings, any house, any pension, and were really scratching by. 
In fact, amongst women 65 years of age and older in the 70s, the poverty rate was 34.7%. So the stories in the Toronto Star about buying a little bit of dog food and cat food to top up the protein were not apocryphal. They weren't made up. The NDP and the Liberals made a motion at the Standing Committee on Community and Social Services to reduce the minister's salary to a dollar because she wasn't doing enough. They also made a motion to reduce the deputy minister's salary to a dollar, which was very smart because he showed up in my office about 12 minutes later. <laughs> Name is Doug Wright and he went on to be president of Waterloo and a nice guy and a good hardworking public servant, but he asked me, Hugh, what are we gonna do about the motion to reduce my salary to a dollar? I said, well, there's two things you can take to the bank. One, we're not going to have an election over protecting your salary. And two, it's not really the law until the motion is passed by the entire legislature, and that won't happen for a few weeks. So why don't we do something radical? Why don't we talk to the NDP and the Liberals and find out what it is they think would be the right answer? Three weeks later, the Honorable W. Darcy McHugh, MPP for Chatham, Kent, Minister of Finance, the province of Ontario, pinstripe suit, University of Montreal tie, Toronto Club cufflinks, the whole schmear, got up and announced the guaranteed annual income supplement for all Ontario senior citizens. It's called the GAINS program. And here's how it worked. Didn't require hiring one more provincial public servant. You file your taxes, falls beneath a certain line, you get automatically topped up, end of story. Three years. The rate of poverty amongst that population went from almost 35% to 3%. So don't you tell me and don't you listen to anybody who tries to tell you that we don't know how to do it, we can't do it efficiently, and we can't do it responsibly. And do you know what happened to our seniors in this great province when that began? the curb on longevity went up. The quality of their life went up. Their ability to rent a slightly better place, buy a little better food, help their grandchildren went up. And now you have a burgeoning seniors community which is healthier and wealthier than they have been for many, many years. There are still problems. The rate of poverty has gone back to about 5%, which is too high. I'm not suggesting the problem is resolved, and you all know that it's not resolved. But the progress was compelling, and it didn't require extra provincial bureaucrats, and it ended up not being all that expensive, because guess what? You see this every day with the people with whom you work. Folks living right on the line don't put the money in our RSPs. They don't stash it in, in bank accounts. They spent it. And when they spend it, it's good for the economy, it generates tax revenue. It is actually, in many ways, substantially self-financing. So that's the good news. A lot of work yet to be done. I'm kind of hopeful, goes to show you how naive I am, that in the national TV debates this election, federal election, there's going to be more than one, somebody might actually have the temerity to raise the issue of poverty. I don't know, call me crazy. It didn't come up in the last election run by the so-called consortium. And I recall having said to Steve Pakin, who I have a high regard for, how can you run national TV debate between the national party leaders and not raise the issue of poverty? To which his response was, well, you know, the consortium does public polling to see what people want to discuss and poverty didn't come up. I said, that's right, Steve, because all the poor people we know living on streets and elsewhere, they're just desperate to get that call from a pollster for the CBC because they live their life for it. I said, Steve, the average person who lives beneath the poverty line is worried about dinner. They're worried about putting stuff in the lunchbox for their kids. That's what they're worried about, and the notion that they're not active politically engaged is because they're disengaged from society. They are pressing their noses up against the glass of the economic mainstream. 
So our report was about how to remove the glass, bring people into the mainstream, productively, economic, efficiently, in a fashion that produced growth, that increased the qualities of our labor force, and said to everybody, the Canadian idea is not just for the few. It's for the whole family. And there are no people in this province who work harder to sustain that entire family than each and every one of you here today, and that's why I am so honored both to accept your award and to spend some time with you this morning. Thank you.